part two of Carl Peverall talking about how he learned to do what he does. But people did not, my patrons did not follow me from one thing to another, but fortunately there were some in each, at each stage that, that, I could, that I could pick on, pick up on. But I always like the feeling of sort of being at the beginning of things and being innocent and not having to analyze things too much, but going on impulse, intuition, and that type of thing. In 2000, and well, back up just a minute, in, in art school, I came across the work of Isamu Noguchi. Now, who, who's familiar? Anybody familiar with Isamu Noguchi? One of the greatest artists, in my opinion, of, of the modern times. Um, a Japanese American. Um, his father was a, a Japanese <coughs> scholar, and uh, his mother was a Jewish Bohemian uh, artist type. And uh, that that uh, he had a very very diverse uh, upbringing. He of course went through you know lived through the uh, World War II and the internment. He was uh, had, you know, he was uh, put in a camp uh, at, at one point because that's what happened to the Japanese residents. But he was a um, he was a prodigy. He was he was just from a very very young age a master at whatever he uh, attempted to do in the art world. And he had some classic good bit of classical training. But at that time when he was coming along, the whole art world exploded, and, became, and the abstract expressionists of New York stole all the attention from Europe, and they became New York became the the center of the, sort of the A order of the art world. And uh, Osama was in there at that time, although his work was not really favored that much. They, the, the critics just didn't really know exactly what to do with him. They acknowledged that he was this great soul, but he wasn't into this kind of get drunk, throw paint all over the place, and uh, sell it for a million, yeah. million, millions of dollars kind of thing. He was an absolute consummate craftsman someone that really was coming from that Japanese tradition of really mastering uh, a craft. And, um, but at the same time, he did have that modernist sensibility of expression. So, Osamu Noguchi's work, he, it just absolutely floored me when I saw him. The thing about his work, though, was it was so incredibly well done, so confident, so massive. It's just for a young, Art student. It's yeah, like can you so, explain to people who don't know who he is what medium he works in? You haven't said that. Well, hopefully they would assume that he works primarily in stone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he, you know, he early on he did a lot of drawing and just sort of the classical uh, breadth of, of art uh, development. But see what I'm saying? Is I, I know with, with my son here, I am going to stay on track. So uh, you're, you're you're very lucky. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it was he he. He was an, and has been and still is an inspiration to me. But his work was so up there and revered. It was like trying to become God, you know, if you were you know, going, to, going to pursue that. It was just, you know, the, the expense of the tools, the space it took, the, the weight of these giant monoliths that he did. So um, I just took that, his aesthetic and his sensibility, this at the time of, of when I entered the, my art training, the the merging of the oriental styles with the american sensibility was a, really a big thing particularly pottery and the people that we were taught to revere and did revere as young students were the were the japanese masters primarily soji hamana of course there was bernard leach out in england but he was uh, he he and hamada were very very close and so uh, that mixture of the, of the American or the Western and the Eastern was really the thing that's part of my, my generation. So Osama Noguchi's always been there, uh, and particularly through the ceramic work that I've done uh, over the years, very much influenced by a sense of form. Um, so the second person would be um, Anthony Gaud uh, from Barcelona. I mean, most everybody Know, knows who he is. Most of you have probably been to Barcelona, right? Seen, seen him, seen his work. How, how many have been to Barcelona? So that's the only place you can see his work in person, right? Um, this again, the stonework, what he does, and also what he had done with tiles and the breaking of tiles and then putting them back together, the breaking apart and putting them back together. That's, that's a very exciting thing of, about art. And Gucci said, is one of his quotes that I love the most, he says, when, when something breaks, that's God talking to you. And it seems to be the case 
all still in the, I work in, in stone too, this piece behind us, the Guardian for instance. Um, that was a, a, a big chunky stone that just seemed too fat. It just the proportion of it was too sort of round and fat. It didn't have a variation of feel that I was totally happy with, although I love the stone. So the first thing I did with that was to drill holes in, uh, linearly in it so that I could split this big girthy part of that upper torso area in two. So that was the first thing I did was like just explode that stone intentionally, but that's the breaking. And then from that, the head part of the piece and the top piece were, were, were made. So um, this breaking apart is, is a big part of it. And sometimes that's done intentionally, and quite often it's done by what you might call an accident, an expression accident. So <laughs> uh, if you can look at it that way, you know? Uh, so. Um, Anthony Gowdy, you know, I could go on and on and on about it. He would be a, a, a whole series of lectures to talk about. One of the most remarkable creators that ever lived, in my opinion. Uh, what he does with what's around him. He builds, you know, he'll just go to a site and just start building from what's right there, the rubble, the sand, the dirt, the, the chunks of fragments of things and create these wonderful, brilliantly arched, supported structures. Just absolutely. He just has everything. Um, and then, again, that really influenced mainly my ceramic work that I was doing and have done and still do to some degree. In 2007, uh, our family was very fortunate to be able to go to New Zealand for six months. This is something my, my wife really was inspired to do. She put this trip together. Her being a physician, was at, she went there uh, recruited really by by the, the consortium in, in, in New Zealand to come and work in a rural area and um, at that time I had sort of retired from making this ceramic work that I felt culminated in 2005 and I was ready to just go on to the next thing after 30 years of doing something concentrating in one area uh, the work that I had done it felt like it had come to a point of completion and I thought, well, you know, I can go on rearranging this forever and maybe fool some people, but I can't fool myself anymore. This is what this has led to, and I really, it's not, I'm done. And um, so I decided just to go out, leave the studio. That, that work was all, I'm more of a maker, I'm much more of a 3D person. Uh, but uh, I was getting something out of it. So when I was, we went to New Zealand, I was, uh, Con going to concentrate just on landscape. I think I did 52 paintings while we were over there in six months. And some of you can go on my website and take a look at some of those paintings. They're all done on location, plein air work, and it was an incredible way to fall helplessly in love with a place, is to, and particularly New Zealand, is to be out there in that amazing world. While I was there, I ran across the work of the third a great mentor and his name is Chris Booth and he is still living uh, the other two are not but Chris is very much alive he's just a year or two older than I am um, he has been working in stone pretty much all his life as a primary medium and I actually did some research I learned about him before we went over there through website research and various things and here I was like I was going I you know I'm on this path now I'm going to concentrate on one thing but to go over there and paint the whole time and then uh oh I see this guy's blood it's like it'll just you know hit the stone man the stone sculptor and, and uh, he, he, what what he was doing was like when I first saw it was like an epiphany for me like as opposed to Osama Noguchi who's he would be handling these massive boulders to carve into and have these very sophisticated diamond machinery and all this kind of stuff to do what he did Chris was doing something at his, his book, which you, I would recommend you all take a look at, it's called Woven Stone. He was taking smaller stones and piecing them together into very, very, very large works. It seemed like something that was accessible. It seems like, some, and he, did, he altered the stones very little, if at all. He would alter them to create structure, but not so much to ornament. 
you know, or carve or do, do things that everybody seems to need to do, which I always seem to need to do in most of my ceramic work, <laughs> ornament, 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 more and more. But he appealed it back, stripped it back, got to some kind of a sense of soul, which, which he, of course, puts in as a result of his own character. And um, won't go, I was, another time I will tell more the story of how we finally did meet, but but uh, it, was only, it was actually two years after we moved back. I wasn't able to meet with him. Actually, I was afraid to meet with him. For two <laughs> years. Well, that's the thing. My wife, you're going know, to get very good things. Yes. We, we, you know, I didn't you know, lived, know where he lived when everybody. I did the research on, <laughs> on his work. I just knew that he was, lived in New Zealand. And he had worked, his works are all over the world. He is a big guy as far as you know, what, what he has done. Very humble person but a great, great artist. But anyway, I didn't, I didn't even try to find out where he lived in New Zealand. I thought, well, New Zealand is a small country, not as small as we think it is, but I'll run into him perhaps while I'm over there and see some of his work. Turns out, we moved about a half a mile from his studio. <laughs> Just out of absolute problems, I guess you might call it. And uh, so, I was so starstruck by his work, first of all, that I was absolutely mortified and embarrassed to call him up and just go and see him. Like, I just felt like the, I just had this big thing in my mind. What, the word in my mind was, how? Like, how did, we, how did you know? I didn't want to just go there and ask him how, because I just I was so mystified by what he did and how he did it. And I just couldn't bear to do that. And secondly, I was now on this track to be a painter and to concentrate on one thing. Now here's this guy, it's a big inspiration, and I think it's un subconsciously it was like, I, this is going to wreck my whole plan, and uh, which it, at, it, 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 but not while I was there, it took two years later I was, was able to return. Um, um, I, I've been fortunate to go back every two years since then to an international artist conference uh, that happens every two years. That's a whole other story. I gotta, can't get into that too much. But anyway, I was able to meet him on my next return in 2009. I wrote him this long letter before I went there, mm -hmm. explaining how much I loved his work, and it just kept coming back. You know, that's destination unknown, blah, 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 blah. I said, well, it's just not going to do And then I serendipitously ran into him at a sculpture that he had just installed there in New Zealand. And uh, we very dear friends ever since. I just fell in love with him and that's why I'd already fallen in his work but he is a wonderful, wonderful soul. I can't speak enough about him and he really, he, his influence is what has led me into being able to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though we do different things, we share a, a, a certain uh, Hindu spirit. He's in the process now of uh, negotiating a sculpture at Storm King. Have you ever been, mm -hmm. been to Storm King in New York, right above New York City? Um, so hopefully we'll have a, a major piece in the U.S. before too long. Okay, that's that's that. What? So um, where should I go from here? I guess Let's now, now I'm going to wait till it gets really hot before we go out. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. So any questions at this point? How yes. do you get your stones to? Yeah. Okay. The question is, how do you how, how do you how do you put them together? How what makes them stay together? Because I play with Right. Right. Well, then this was this was the thing that uh, of all my years of stone stacking and hiking and making things out in nature, whatever, is uh, for many years wanted to make a permanent thing, but no idea how in the world to do it. How do you actually penetrate this amazing stuff? In. Two two things basically. First of all, you got to have a way to drill. It. So we use diamond core drills, which has a water jet system in it, and it, it's you know you can get core drills this what big in diameter down to this one. So that's that's our our thing. That's our dental tool, our, our dental mm -hmm. dentist from hell tool. You know, it sounds like a giant monster dentist working out there. We call ourselves the petrodontist. Uh, <laughs> so we're gonna walk around with you, and I wanted to do one quick yeah. commercial break. Y'all can stay as long as you want to. As is our custom, our home, we live here, is open to you. There are, yes, there is one facility in it. <laughs> You're welcome to use that. Um, stay tuned as Carl takes us to see each of the main.